Good morning and welcome to the spring 2021 seminar in American religion. My name is Kathleen Sprose Cummings and I'm the director of the Kushwa Center for the Study of American Catholicism at Notre Dame, where I am also a professor in the departments of American Studies and History. I want to extend a very warm welcome to all of our participants, especially to those who may be joining the seminar for the first time. Obviously, today's virtual setup means there are more first timers than usual. For four decades now, the Seminar in American Religion has convened twice each year to provide historians of North American religion and other interested scholars with an opportunity to discuss a recent notable book in the field. The topic of today's seminar is Darren Dochuk's Anointed with Oil, How Christianity and Crude Made Modern America, published in 2019 by Basic Books. As most of you know, we had to postpone this event almost exactly a year ago with the onset of the coronavirus pandemic. And we're very happy to gather now, if only virtually. I wanna thank Shane Ulbrich and Madonna Noak of the Kushwa Center for organizing this event twice. And I also wanna thank Tim Chicos from Notre Dame Studios for making this event and indeed all our Kushwa events over the last year possible. It's now my pleasure to introduce briefly our distinguished panelists, beginning with our featured author, my colleague, Darren Dochuk. Darren is the Andrew V. Tackies College Professor of History at Notre Dame, where he also serves as the Director of Graduate Studies for the History Department and does so exceptionally well. Many of our doctoral students participating in the seminar this morning uh, can attest their gratitude toward Darren for his service in that capacity. Darren has written widely on religion, politics, economics, and culture in American life. His first book, From Bible Belt to Sun Belt, Plain Folk Religion, Grassroots Politics, and the Rise of Evangelical Conservatism, published by Norton in 2011, received the Alan Nevins Prize from the Society of American Historians, the John H. Dunning Prize from the American Historical Association, and the Ellis Hawley Prize from the Organization of American Historians. Darren is the co-editor of a number of books, including the forthcoming Beyond the Culture Wars, Recasting Religion and Politics in the 20th Century United States, soon to be published with Notre Dame Press. Darren's research has been supported by the Clement Center for Southwest Studies at Southern Methodist University, Princeton Center for the Study of Religion, the American Council of Learned Societies, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the American Philosoph Philosophical Society, the Rockefeller Foundation, and the Canadian government. Darren has long been a friend of the Kushwa Center, and since 2017, he has been a member of, this, of the Center's Faculty Advisory Board. Welcome, Darren. We're exceptionally fortunate to have two excellent commentators to get our discussion started this morning, Professors Melanie McAllister and Andrew Preston. Melanie McAllister is Professor of American Studies and International Affairs at George Washington University. Her research and teaching focuses on the intersections of cultural and political history and on the role of religion and culture in shaping U.S. interests in other parts of the world. She is the author or editor of a number of books, including Epic Encounters, Culture, Media, and U.S. Interest in the Middle East since 1945, and The Kingdom of God Has No Borders, A Global History of American Evangelicals. With Marie Griffith, she co-edited the book Religion and Politics in the Contemporary United States, and she is co-editor with Max Friedman and David Engerman of volume four of the forthcoming Cambridge History of America and the World. In 2017, Melanie won a fellowship from the National Endowment of the Humanities in support of her research on her next book on the cultural uh, history of humanitarianism in the Cold War. She has been a fellow at, Pr at Princeton's Davis Center for Historical Studies and its Center for the Study of Religion, as well as a fellow at the University of Pennsylvania's Annenberg School of Communication. She is on the board of directors of the American Council of Learned Societies and serves on the editorial boards of Modern American History and American Quarterly. She often provides commentary for media outlets ranging from the Washington Post and the Atlantic to the BBC, Al Jazeera, and Irish Radio One. Thank you, Melanie, for being with us today. Andrew Preston is Professor of American History at the University of Cambridge, where he is a fellow of Clare College. His teaching and research focuses on the history of American foreign relations, primarily since 1898. 
He is the author of The War Council, McGeorge Bundy, The NSC, and Vietnam, Sword of the Spirit, Shield of Faith, Religion in American War and Diplomacy, which won the Charles Taylor Prize for Literary Nonfiction, and American Foreign Relations, a very short introduction. Andrew has also co-edited other, several other books, including two forthcoming volumes, Rethinking American Grand Strategy, come, to be published with Oxford University this year, and The Cambridge History of America and the World, Volume 3, also to be published with Cambridge this year. In 2021, Andrew is serving as president of the Society for Historians of American Foreign Relations. He also serves on the editorial boards of Modern American History, the Historical Journal, Rhetoric and Public Affairs, and Diplomacy and Statecraft. He is frequently a contributor to Toronto's Globe and Mail, with past commentary appearing in outlets ranging from the New Republic, London Review of Books, USA Today, The New Statesman, Foreign Affairs, and The Times Literary Supplement. Andrew, thank you for being with us. A word now on format. We will hear from our commentators first, and then we'll give Darren an opportunity to respond to them briefly, and we'll then turn to audience questions. We've received a number of questions in advance, but we invite all participants to submit your questions during the webinar through the Q&A tool on your screen. In normal times, the seminar would run close to three hours. Uh, we are all aware that we can't simply migrate our usual events onto Zoom, so being mindful of Zoom fatigue, we are going to uh, aim to have this event end uh, in about 90 minutes. That's not a hard stop. I certainly won't cut off uh, anyone in, in the middle of a fascinating thread, but uh, we are going to aim to uh, end around uh, 90 minutes from now. With that, I will invite Andrew to begin our session this morning. Thank you. Great, thanks, Kathy. Um, and thanks to you for the introduction. Thanks to Shane Ulbrich as well um, for the inv invitation, excuse me, to um, visit the Kushwa Center. Unfortunately, we can't visit the Kushwa Center, as you said. Um, and I was so looking forward to uh, heading to Notre Dame last year, um, along with a lot of other visits to see friends and family that have been suddenly canceled. But I have to say I'm really grateful that we've been able to, to do this in the end, even if it's over Zoom, and even if we all, all are um, Zoombies by now after a year of doing this. These events may not replicate the in-person experience, but they come close. And I think this is the, exactly the type of format that will come close. We can't see each other face to face, and I do miss seeing people uh, in person. Um, but I think this is this is the next best thing, and I'm really, really excited to be uh, taking part. I'd also like to just extend a thanks to um, Madonna Noak for her friendly and efficient support in setting this up last year and again this year over endless emails. She's one of the people I've been emailing with the most frequently, I'd say, and that's not because she's inefficient. It's, it's because I am inefficient, and she's very, been very patient in shepherding everything through all the nuts and bolts uh, and whatnot. So thanks to Madonna Noak um, as well. And I want to say it's an honor and a privilege to be speaking about Darren Dochuk's book, Anointed with Oil. Um, but it's also an honor and a privilege to be uh, speaking alongside my friend and colleague, Melanie McAllister, one of the finest scholars of American uh, religion, um, and especially how religion has influenced America's um, role in the rest of the world. Uh, and I'm looking forward to what they both uh, have to say. Okay, I'd like to begin my comments with a personal story. About 12 years ago, maybe a little more, when I was researching a book on the intersection between American religion and US foreign policy, I kept running into a mercurial figure I'd heard of, but only dimly knew. And that's the firebrand fundamentalist, Carl McIntyre. Uh, he, was, he established and was head of the American Council of Christian Churches. He was extremely conservative in his theology and that translated into an extremely conservative stance as well uh, on religion. So much so um, that his stance on foreign policy uh, and his stance on religion merged so that he mounted campaigns in the late 60s and early 70s against uh, organizations, not just like UNESCO, which is a familiar uh, target of American conservatives, but also UNICEF. Um, and not simply because it was, uh, it, it had become associated with Halloween and this kind of pagan uh, uh, anti-religious, anti-Christ uh, type celebration um, uh, every October 31st but because it was associated um, with the United Nations, uh, despite the fact that the money was going to children. And he mounted these campaigns against UNICEF and I came across them and I thought, what an interesting figure. Um, and I, I kind of knew that he would become an important part of my book, but I didn't really know where to find uh, primary 
sources on him. At the time, 12 to 15 years ago, he was barely covered in the historiography and I couldn't find a collection of papers uh, on him. They were scattered around and even uh, back issues of the newspaper that Carl McIntyre published, The Christian Beacon, were extremely hard uh, to get a hold of. And this is of course before uh, digitized databases and whatnot. I received a tip that the place to look for McIntyre's papers, for anything to do with McIntyre if you're looking for primary sources, was the Pew Family Archive at the Hagley Museum in Wilmington, Delaware, especially the personal papers of J. Howard Pew. That hot tip changed my book, and I would say uh, all for the better. The Pew papers were incredibly rich with all sorts of original records on American religion, um, from personal letters to newsletters, from private prayers to pamphlets churned out in the thousands, but now mostly lost to the ravages of time or mildew in people's basements and so on and so forth, um, except at, in the Pew papers at the Hagley Museum. Hundreds of boxes um, with box after box, folder after folder, just completely uh, stuffed with incredible archival materials on American religion, especially evangelical and fundamentalist uh, Protestantism, but also on liberal Protestantism uh, as well. And there was so much on Carl McIntyre. I can't begin to tell you. If you're going to study McIntyre, you have to head to Wilmington to the Hagley Museum to look at the Pew Papers. Um, but it wasn't just about McIntyre. And I was able to find what I wanted on McIntyre and then find so much more. It was an absolute gold mine uh, for me. And I would say it, it's still a gold mine for anyone studying 20th century American religion. Okay, at the time, I didn't really ponder why the personal papers of an oil baron would house one of the richest collections of Christian nationalist politics and faith. But if I had stopped to ponder that question, as I probably should have, as, as any good historian uh, would have, um, uh, 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 instead, I've had to wait until the publication of Anointed with Oil for an answer. This luminous book sheds the brightest light, not just on the history of American energy, not just uh, on the history of American religion, but on the history of modern America itself. It's a kind of skeleton key, the way these stories intersect and interweave uh, over the course of its uh, hundreds of pages, um, a skeleton key to understanding modern America itself. The intersection of oil with religion powers Darren's historical engine and his drive to tell a new story of modern America. Okay, no more puns about oil, I'm, I'm done with that. And the result is a highly original, ingenious way of reinterpreting the modern United States. But the book is more than just a reimagined history of one country. It's a history of resource extraction and can be read as that, uh, as simply as that, as a history uh, of resource extraction and its effect um, on, uh, on the environment, if religion doesn't really float your boat. It can be read as a history of American religion, if fossil fuels don't light your fire. Sorry, I guess I can't resist the puns. Um, I will try and weed them out though as I go along. But it's also a history of the US and the world an international history, a global transnational history of the highest order. It's a book not just for folks in the American Society for Church History or the Business History Conference or the American Society for Environmental History, um, though there's nothing wrong with appealing to uh, any of those organizations, let alone all three. And the fact that the book speaks to all three crowds, I would say is a huge achievement in and of itself. It's also a book for diplomatic historians, for international historians, for transnational historians, and for world historians. I can't recall who gave me that tip to go to the Hagley Museum in Wilmington, Delaware, but I'm actually certain, and I was giving this a lot of thought, I'm certain it was Darren who put me onto uh, the Pew Papers at Hagley. We met for the first time around this time when we were both um, working on our first books and thinking about our second books. I'm sure that's correct. I'm sure it was Darren, and it certainly wouldn't surprise me because as, a, as an historian, as a professionally trained historian, I should have thought of those connections when I went to the Hagley Museum. I should have been thinking, why on earth are these Carl McIntyre papers, along with a lot of other religious papers, here in the papers uh, of an oil baron? Well, Darren did think of that question. And not only has he thought of that, did he think of that question, he's gone ahead uh, and answered it. As a historian, Darren likes to focus on the secular places many other historians, religious historians, have ignored or as he himself puts it, quote, areas few historians have considered relevant to religious folk, end quote. Uh, and of these people, most obviously he's looking at, quote, the oil and gas extraction industries for which evangelicals constructed cultural agencies to match this capitalist system, all the while putting their accumulated wealth to work for right-wing political endeavors, 
end quote. I have to confess, I just pulled uh, a bit of a, a bait and switch there, a bit of a sleight of hand, because I wasn't quoting from Anointed with Oil. I was quoting from Darren's first book, From Bible Belt to Sun Belt, which is an incredible book. And it's, it's also, like Anointed with Oil, um, uh, an absolutely riveting book uh, to read. In From Bible Belt to Sun Belt, Darren's first book, he touches on the oil men and their networks. But surprisingly briefly, and I, I didn't realize that until I was rereading Anointed with Oil for this session today, and then I went back to From Bible Belt to Sun Belt, and I noticed a few scattered references here and there, but there was hardly anything. Um, and what I'd like to do, I'd like to take this opportunity um, to ask him about the process of writing this second book, and if it did emerge from his first book, if the questions that he's answering in the second book came from the first book. Compared to From Bible Belt to Sun Belt, Anointed with Oil seemingly narrows its focus, right? It's not just on religion and politics across 20th century America, but specifically on how oil and religion have shaped one another, how they've intersected with one another, which seems very specific. Um, but that's actually the wrong perspective to take. For this seemingly narrower focus allows him to broaden out in all sorts of imaginative ways that nobody would have expected. Most obviously geographically to Canada, the Middle East, East Asia, Southeast Asia, Latin America, uh, and elsewhere, but also into other aspects of religious history to look at other Protestants, other Christians, and indeed uh, other faiths. And as stated earlier, even other fields of historical inquiry, such as the US and the world, transnational history, um, and international history. When did Darren realize that zooming the camera in for a tightly focused shot would also allow him simultaneously to pull back for a wide angle landscape shot. It's actually an incredibly difficult thing to do as an historian, and he's done it uh, with this book. And so this book then, Anointed with Oil, um, is neither a sequel nor uh, a new um, departure, but it's a different kind of second book. It's a very unusual uh, second book. Usually people go, as I did, from a very short book, a very small book, which was based on a dissertation, to something that might be bigger, maybe take you in new directions. In this case, he's gone in similar directions, but also in very new directions. Um, and he's also gone from big to big. Um, his first book, From Bible Belt to Sun Belt, was unusually long uh, for a first book, and not worse for it, because it's so beautifully written. Um, uh, so I'd like to hear more about the actual process uh, of, of Darren writing this second book, and how he made some strategic decisions in writing this second book. Perhaps even more than From Bible Belt to Sun Belt, Anointed with Oil is a rich history of religion as a cultural system. In Durkheimian terms, or with Geertsy and thick description, Anointed with Oil explores the inseparability of religious faith with politics, economic ideology, political culture, ad and attitudes to race, labor, gender, and other topics. For both liberals and conservatives, for lack of better terms, did oil prospecting create religious culture? That's an obvious book, uh, question that hangs over the book. Or was it vice versa? Did re religious culture create this kind of uh, oil culture? Or was it both? To his credit, Darren is never essentialist or reductive in making definitive claims as to whether the chicken or the egg came first and caused the other. In other words, he doesn't really spend time answering those questions, which I think is a strength of the book. Um, and I'm curious if it was a deliberate strategy or simply the byproduct of, of, of a good historian doing, uh, doing his job. And this is indeed something I could learn myself, or I, maybe where I'm too tempted to answer those questions that shouldn't be answered in that kind of reductive way. Anointed with oil therefore belongs on the top shelf alongside not just for, from Bible Belt to Sun Belt, but also work by some of the most important scholars in this vein of the last 20 years of looking at religious history as cultural history and cultural history as religious history and not really separating them and not even not, not doing so uh, and, and, and doing their writing their books in, in a very natural and, and not reductive or essentialist way. And here I include not just Melanie who, um, who we're going to hear from in a moment, but also Matthew Sutton, Barbara Savage, Bethany Morton, Marie Griffith, Lee Schmidt, um, and, and others. The richest discovery along these lines in Anointed with Oil is in the rivalry between the majors and the minors, the ecumenical elite, and the evangelical populists. That's, that's my big takeaway from the book, probably because it's what I also focus on in my own work to a certain extent. It plays out in Anointed with Oil from the beginning. Indeed, that's how the book begins with its wonderful scene setter about Patillo Higgins and the constant struggle over oil and over faith between the establishment and the plain folk. It maps out so perfectly, so neatly over such a long period of time that I'm stunned that nobody discovered it until Darren did with this book. 
So the wildcat are fundamentalists like the Stewarts or Union uh, Stewarts of Union Oil, or the Pew family and Sun Oil take on the Rockefellers and the ecumenical Protestant elite, and that goes on from the late 19th century right up through the 1960s and so and 70s. And I would say culminating to me, this was the real climax of the book um, in the battle between J. Howard Pew and Nelson Rockefeller between the Pews, the Wildcatter Pews, and the and the Majors Rockefellers for the soul of the Republican Party in 1964, and then to 1968, and then on into the 1970s, indeed continuing in some form to our present day uh, with, with figures like the Koch brothers. On the faith side, my favorite personal exemplars of, of what Darren's arguing along these lines um, in this kind of new populist history, not only of religion, not only of oil, but of uh, the two, um, are, Hem are Harry Emerson Fosdick and Billy Graham. And not just because they perfectly embody the liberal and conservative factions of American Protestantism. On page 179, Rockefeller Jr. invites the ultra-modernist Fosdick, recently charged by his fellow Presbyterians with heresy, to preach at the Park Avenue Baptist Church, and then later at the non-denominational Riverside Church uh, next to Union Theological Seminary, which was funded with Rockefeller money. On page 364, we have a kind of inverse of this. It's really interesting where Billy Graham, a Presbyterian, tells his friends, wealthy Texan oil barons like Sid Richardson and H.L. Hunt, that he is, quote, at heart a Baptist and half Texan. So in both cases, you have Presbyterians becoming more Baptist because of oil barons, but very different types of oil barons. And I, I find that almost impossible to disentangle. And I wonder if, Darren, I said earlier that it was a strength of the book that he doesn't disentangle it, but I wonder if he could uh, disentangle that a little bit uh, for us and maybe pull those threads a little bit for us uh, a little more today. This was a different, this new conservative uh, uh, alignment between Sid Richardson and H.L. Hunt and Billy Graham um, and whatnot was a different kind of ecumenical movement. We don't call it an ecumenical movement, but it was not liberal, but conservative. And just as, as David Hollinger's Rockefeller funded ecumenical Protestants would dominate the first half of the 20th century, the Pew and Richardson funded evangelical Protestants would dominate the second. The global aspects of Darren's book are among its freshest, and they left me wondering if there's another even bigger story here to tell, one in which the United States isn't at the center. To be sure, Anointed with Oil is genuinely transnational, with flows not just emanating outwards from the United States, but reciprocally flowing back to the United States. It's a kind of outside-in process, as the title of another book to which both Darren and Melanie have contributed chapters puts it. It's a fine book if I, if I do say so myself. And Canada is a really interesting example in Darren's book. Um, uh, Canada, which is so similar to the United States and yet is a really interesting sort of control um, for Darren's experiment in telling this history of the intertwining of religion and oil. And here with the Canadian example, mostly in Alberta, also Ontario, but mostly Alberta, um, we don't have just American hegemony, not just the projection of American power, not just the process of Americanization, which has long dominated the study of American interactions with the rest of the world, but we have reciprocal flows of culture, politics, economic thought, uh, heading back to the United States. And here, Darren's portrait of Ernest Manning is incredibly compelling. And I know this is knowing where Darren is from, knowing his personal history, I know this must have been a labor of love to write these, these, these passages, these sections of the chapters on the Alberta oil patch. But uh, returning to the question I started asking a moment ago, is there another book to write on the intersection between fossil fuels, especially oil, and the rest of the world? A book in which the United States is a minor player, maybe even not mentioned at all, or just in passing. Is that even possible? Was the pull of the tractor beam that was the American century simply too powerful? I'd love to hear Darren's thoughts on that. In the last few minutes I have, and I'll, I'll try and be um, quicker with my last few comments, I just wanted to flag up some of the other things that I think are signal contributions that Darren may or may not want to follow up on in his comments. This is also a history of missions. It's a history of Christian, mostly Protestant missions, American Protestant missions, um, not just liberal, ecumenical, not just conservative, evangelical, but both. Oil money and missionaries went hand in hand from the very beginning in, to an extent that I had, it was completely surprising to me. And I, I wrote a book um, in which missionaries are also pretty prominent. And I mentioned Rockefeller here and there and other people, but the extent to which missions and oil um, at home, but especially abroad, uh, were, were conjoined um, is really, really astonishing. 
Uh, this is in terms of philanthropy. This is in terms of boots on the ground. This is in terms of cultural exchange and interpretation. And it's also in terms, as David Ekblad puts it, in his secular history of efforts to promote overseas economic development, the great American mission. And that's basically the theme as well that runs through Anointed with Oil. In this sense, Anointed with Oil adds, to me, unexpectedly, it adds significantly to the really, really rich new historiography on American Christian, especially Protestant missions and how their impact was not just in religious circles, but in every facet of American life, and in ways that continue to reverberate a century later, and indeed continue to go on uh, today. I mentioned earlier David Hollinger and his work on this field. Um, Melanie McAllister's most recent book, which Kathy mentioned in her introduction, is one of the more important, one of the most important um, books in this, in this field, in the study of missionaries uh, in the last 30 or 40 years. Um, a very specific question, and then I'll wrap up, and that's on um, dispensational premillennialists or premillennial dispensationalists, whichever, whichever you prefer, the theological conservatives who are major players um, in, in Darren's book. And I wanted to know more, it's sort of alluded to towards the end, but I want to know more on their attitudes towards climate change. I remember Bill Moyers about 20 years ago commenting that um, premillennial dispensationalists, because of their theology, want to bring on the end times, and that is causing them to uh, deny the reality of climate change and deny, deny climate science. Um, and to drill baby drill, as Sarah Palin puts it, and as Darren quotes her towards uh, the end of the book. And so I actually don't know a whole lot of, this is a genuine question. It's not one of those scholars questions where I'm asking you a question I already have an answer to. I'm genuinely curious as to where we are now, or maybe in the last five years, between the relationship between conservative religion, conservative theology especially, um, and climate change and the environment. The very last thing I'd like to say about the book is the writing. The writing is so gorgeous. If you haven't read this book, if you haven't already read Darren's first book, the writing is just to die for. It's, it, a lot of people um, say that a historian writes in novelistic ways, um, but Darren really does. This is an absolute uh, pleasure to read. I marked up so many turns of phrase that I wanted to, uh, to read out. And there were way too many. And in fact, I'm gonna skip, I was gonna read three of them. I'll just do one because I noticed that I am running out of time. Um, but little turns of phrase that are both at once substance, but also style. Like on page 283, where Darren writes about a Middle Eastern blitz of Bibles and drill bits. And that just captures right there, that captures just that little phrase, everything that that chapter is all about. And the book is chock full of colorful characters, not just the famous ones like Rockefeller, Ida Tarbell, Pew, Billy Graham, people like that, but these obscure people I'd never heard of who are so fascinating, like Dad Joyner and Daisy Bradford, like R.W. Fenn, like that shooting star of recent politics, Sarah Palin, who of course everyone knows about. She's not obscure, even though she's, I'd say, pretty much forgotten. But thinking about her as a Pentecostal from the Alaska oil patch, what that means for her politics and for the politics of the last 20 years. In closing, I am out of time. Uh, I would love to say more. I hope I get a chance to say more, but I would just like to say it's a landmark book. It's important across many fields, but most of all, it's just a terrific history, wonderfully told. Thank you. Melanie, you're muted. Sorry. I'll jump right in now. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so thank you. I, it's great to hear Andrew's beautiful presentation and um, also difficult to follow. But I'll just start out by saying also how much I have been a long time admirer of Darren's work from Bible Belt to Sun Belt was absolutely central for me in thinking about my last book on evangelicals. Um, it is located in local histories, in social history, in cultural <laughs> religious history in ways that are very deeply impressive. Um, and so I also am honored to get to talk about this book today. And um, in addition to be doing so alongside Andrew, whose book was probably the other book that had the most influence on my last work um, mm. um, from uh Who's, who I still use as a, as a kind of textbook of trying to go and understand religion and politics in the, in the last um, 150 years. So, um, so thanks to, for, for the Notre Dame and the Kushwa Center for inviting me, to Darren for writing this extraordinary book and, and really a pleasure to be here. Um, 
I'm just going to say a few things. First, I want to start where Andrew ended by talking about how beautifully written this book is. Um, as somebody who tries hard to write accessibly, I was uh, in awe of how um, um, well written and and exciting and um, and yet. Um, not visible the writing is. I mean, it's not someone who's trying to do a tour de force so much as just getting you through the story in a, in a quite um, extraordinary way. It's also ambitious. As Andrew said, it grows across uh, 200, well over 200 years of history. It crosses continents, disciplinary fields, um, and is researched at levels that are um, hard to do justice to. I mean, the amount of research that Darren did for this book I'm, I'm truly uh, in awe of and impressed with. And it provides for us through all of that, a through line for thinking about oil, religion, environmental history, domestic politics and international affairs. Seeing those things, not just all of those things, but seeing their connection. So I think Darren's provided a, a contribution to each of those fields individually, but he has done what people have been arguing for some time needs to be done, but it, which is hard, which is to actually bring those fields into conversation, to bring those ways of thinking into conversation, to take religion, capitalism, um, domestic politics and international affairs all with kind of equal seriousness and see their intersections, see how much they um, depend on each other or write each other. The book is peopled with figures whose complexity, vivacity, greed, and piety are all very much on stage. Um, I loved um, reading about people I already knew something about, but also learning about new ones and seeing how their, um, uh, their own mix of desire uh, and economic situation, background, and historical moment created opportunities for them to do the things that they did in constructing these two um, types of characters. I mean, for those of you who've read the book, you know, the fundamental argument about um, the civil religion of crude versus wildcat Christianity is an argument that asked us to see two major ways of thinking and being in the world. Um, the Rockefellers exemplifying a civil religion of crude, which is trying to both you know, live ecumenical Protestantism as it's most waspy, but at the same time has those same values in trying to organize and, um, uh, and uh, structure the oil industry versus what he calls wildcat Christianity, which is everything from the smaller uh, players in the oil industry to those folks who are um, outside the realm of the most um, central and organized parts of ecumenical Christianity. And I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, like Andrew, I was really struck by what I did not know about the impact of oil money on missions and missionaries as oil ambassadors. I know a lot about missionaries and what I learned about the impact of oil money, um, the ways in which people with um, those oral connections influenced and funded specific missionary projects is quite striking um, and really has to have all of us tell the story differently, the relationship between capitalism and missions differently by paying attention to, um, to following that money. And so that was, I think to me as a scholar, that was the moment when I said, oh, I, I said a word I won't replace, I won't repeat now, but oh goodness, um, <laughs> this is something I should have paid more attention to and that really is important and, and stunning to learn about. Um, I, one of my favorite moments in the book is when is near the end. I mean, you know, my period is more post 45 and really more post 1960. So the end of the book was more the area where I knew best. And I really enjoyed the part where the ecumenical church fights back against its own, where David Rockefeller goes to um, get an award at Harvard and he basically gets shouted at from the activist in the crowd um, for his complicity with South African apartheid, for Rockefeller's doing business in South Africa and therefore being seen as complicit. 
here's someone who sees himself as representing a kind of benevolent global order and who suddenly, um, whose civil religion version of that has to face down the radical elements that it has helped create. That there's no question that ecumenical Protestantism had become more and more liberal in this period, more broadly, the World Council of Churches had made fighting racism in all its forms a major platform by 1968, was funding the anti-apartheid uh, movement, including the ANC by 1969. And yet Rockefeller's still there, you know, tr trying to get his, his award, which he clearly felt right in line with facing the, the um, unexpected yet perhaps predictable consequences of that liberalism of a certain kind of ecumenical Protestantism. So how the history of race, of missions and environment shifted fundamentally the presumptions of the orderly elite management exemplified by the Rockefellers is one of the great stories of the book and one I really appreciated. I also love the attention to race, not only um, race in racism in the oil fields, um, but also African American um, players, including Jake Simmons, the wildcat entrepreneur who, who um, ends up doing a lot of work in Ghana. I thought that was just a, a way of showing how talking about a, do, a highly racialized dominant white culture does not mean leaving people of color out of the story and not only and again, not only as victims, but also sewing them as complex agents. So I really appreciated that as well. Okay, so a few questions, since one has to ask a few questions, even in the finest book. Um, so my first question is really about this question of wild, this, this term wildcat Christianity. The civil religion of crude, I got, you know, I got the ways in which it basically maps on to ecumenical Protestantism of its most main stream and, and an empowered form, really. But wildcat Christianity seems to me to be so capacious as a category that I wondered what it really is. And I, I'd like to ask Darren to speak to that because of course, being a historian of evangelicals, I wanted to read it as evangelicals, um, you know, and that, you know, independence, you know, premillennial dispensationalism, believing in extraction, uh, you know, all of those things which mess map so well onto certain forms of, uh, of evangelical um, spirituality. But at different points, the people who were included under this category, wildcat Christianity, which after all is trying to map oil, not religion exactly, right? It's trying to say who are these people in the oil industry and how is what is their relationship to religion? It, under that category, at times, uh, Darren includes diviners and spiritualists, people who are looking for oil with divining rods, people who are explicitly spiritualist, not necessarily Christian in their orientation. He includes Pentecostals, Catholics of various stripes, um, Methodists who, you know, are always complicated. You never know where a Methodist stand. Sometimes they're mainline ecumenical, sometimes they're ecumenical, sometimes they're um, evangelicals and they're always all over the uh, country in ways that are, are quite complicated. The staunch Presbyterian Howard Pugh, who um, even, you know, in, in any other category might be considered an ecumenical Protestant. Now, I actually think that this doesn't actually, nest. there's a way which I like the capaciousness and the messiness of this category, particularly because, and this is something I think Darren doesn't talk enough about, but you know, he talks a lot about plenty of things, so he didn't have to talk about everything, but that missionaries work itself, the globalization of American Christianity already was muddying these categories that um, ecumenical Protestantism, um, and again, I realize it's not exactly the same as the, the civil religion of crude, but ecumenical Protestantism in the form of the World Council of Churches is reaching out all over the world and bringing in all sorts of people, including um, uh, Pentecostals in Nigeria or Congo or uh, um, 
uh, Thailand bringing or Korea bringing in all sorts of people whose whose beliefs would do, don't map into this U.S. divide we have between evangelical and ecumenical, and in fact, the largest ecumenical organization in the world is significantly evangelical, and so that be, be kind of interesting as a way of thinking about how missionary work and the global change in Christianity messes up the categories of the United States, but it still leaves me with questions that I'd like to hear more about, about what wildcat Christianity consists of exactly. Um, the second point I want to make is really about um, oil as an actant. Now, um, Darren published this book with Knopf, and so he's not going to get to talk uh, a lot of theory talk, and maybe that's all for the better. But many of the books that I thought about when I was reading this that I admi also greatly admire, um, Timothy Mitchell's book, uh, um, Rule of Experts, Greg Grandin's book on Fordlandia, both tell environmental histories in which they take um, non-human as central players. And at times, Dara definitely talks about the way oil destroys the environment. I mean, that is mentioned throughout, although um, it might uh, be something I would like to see talked about more fully throughout. So Tim Mitchell, when he talks about the uh, impact of World War II in Egypt, talks about a lot of things. But one of the things he talks about is the, the impact of the mosquito and how it made because of you know, a variety of reasons, the mosquito brings all sorts of disease into Egypt, which affects the outcome of battles in World War II and of course affects the entire history of, of Egypt under colonialism. The mosquito becomes a kind of actant using Bourdieu's terms of the non-human whose actions nonetheless shape. They are not simply shaped by humans. The same thing with rubber blight in, in, in Grandin's um, discussion of Fordlandia in Brazil, where rubber has a pushbackness, and it in the rubber blight, the the destruction of rubber by um, insect blight has a huge impact on Ford and therefore on imperialism. So here I wonder what it would mean not to only describe oil's destructiveness, but to actually talk about oil as as a player more fully oil what oil does the way it pushes back the way it destroys places and the way it um you know sort of sometimes refuses to show up and sometimes shows up and then disappears and the idea that oil is um uh visceral not just viscous but visceral in its impact um it helps us think, I think, then about the central role of oil in the Anthropocene, which comes comes quite late in the book, um, but I think really helps us think about um, if we think of the Anthropocene not just as the moment which the long moment, the hundreds of years in which humans have fundamentally refigured the environment, but the long moment in which humans begin to grasp that the environment will fundamentally refigure us. Um, no matter what attempts we tend, we claim to control it, I'd like to think about um, those kind of categories, those kinds of uh, theoretical framings, how they might shape how you think about oil in the book. And then my last point is a kind of a very picky one, but it's one I really wanted to talk about since, um, you know, the Middle East is an area of great interest of mine. And um, I thought for someone who is, you know, taking on a huge topic. Darren did an amazing job with taking on like the entire US relationship to the Middle East through the lens of oil. And he takes on, you know, everybody's favorite bugaboo in a way is William Eddy, who's such a complicated figure and does so many things and is so um, uh, fascinating and, and deeply problematic at the same time. But William Eddy is someone who in the book is one of the exemplars of our kind of missionary connected person who believes in the kind of petro promise of bringing the Middle East into the modern era, making it rich and making um, peace through uh, peace through wealth on a kind of Arabist side and who was very much um, critical of Israel and, and in fact deeply um, anti-Zionist and sometimes anti-Semitic. 
so on page 422, there's a really interesting moment where it, uh, Darren is kind of unpacking William Eddy's you know, complexity and he talks about um, Eddy who is meeting up with the Reverend Daniel Poling um, and he's upset because Daniel Poling or Poling has told tourists um, in Beirut and, and now I'm quoting Poling that it was a pity and this is a probably 1960, 61, the date's a little unclear from the site, but around 60, 61. Pauling told tourists that it was a pity the Palestinian refugees refused to go back to their homes in Israel. And Eddie then blasts him and says, Christians and Muslims are never be treated equally in Israel. And he goes on and he says various things. Um, about how wrong this article is. But what either he does not say, and certainly what Darren does not say, is the very striking fact that in 1960, no Palestinian refugees would have been allowed to go back to their homes in Israel. This is just absolutely fake. This is, I mean, it's actually false. That um, to, for people to, it reminds me of my Arabic teacher at one point who was just like tutoring me in Arabic and she was a Palestinian and she was, she told me she was like raising money at her workplace for like some Palestinian children's charity. And this was in the eighties or nineties. And, and she, you know, says, would you like to give some money for Palestinian children? And one of her colleagues says, those Palestinians, they make me so mad. Why don't they just go back to where they came from and leave the Israelis alone? This is exactly the kind of thing this guy is saying. And it, and it kind of lets, let sand. So um, the thing, the question about how Israel is trying to get oil wealth, is trying to do all sorts of things, um, but the fact that the, Air, that the people who were pro-Arab or pro-Palestinian, which could be actually different things, were not necessarily just holding that position because they believed in pro Arab, you know, civil religion of crude uh, a la the Rockefellers, but because of these, you know, kind of obvious humanitarian um, issues. And of course, Darren knows that, he talks about it. Um, the fact that ecumenical Protestants were concerned about Palestinians from the 1940s due to their long uh, impact, due to their long um, uh, position in terms of doing missionary work. But I would also argue that the, the people who are supposedly kind of on the, the kind of religion of the uh, civil religion of crude, the ecumenical Protestants also were deeply pro-Israel in due in part to the kind of tourism in which they might go on to Israel where they're told a lot of um, narratives about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, including the notion that it was the Palestinians fault that they refused to go back to their homes. Um, okay, just to conclude, I want to conclude with the conclusion. Well, two things. I want to conclude with the conclusion and also another moment of beautiful writing. Um, on page 400, there's a sentence that I wish I had written, but gives you an idea again of how um, beautiful the book is as, as, as Darren begins to wind down the story towards um, the end of the Cold War. Uh, amid the chaos of the late 1970s and 1980s, he writes, they're, they're the ecumenical religion of crude people. Their buoyant dreams of a petro-fueled Pax Americana died a thousand painful deaths. Which is about as good a summary of what happened to America's oil vision as I could ever imagine. And overall, the conclusion, although it's brief, and I would have loved more, um, that covers the kind of post-2000 um, period. It's breathtaking, it's intelligent, it's succinct, it covers war, carbon-free activist, um, all sorts of things that make it really um, an extraordinarily fine piece of um, analysis where religion falls less to the, you know, religion matters, all sorts of people are religion, but the religion frame, the binary religion frame falls apart, as he says, it's the, the, the world change, changes in ways that don't hold that. But the attention to religion is beautifully done. Um, I'll just add, I'll just ask two final questions. One is, I'd like to hear 
um, uh, as um, Andrew asked about where in um, how uh, Darren's work changed from book one to book two in terms of um, the the you know kind of attention to these oil figures. I'd like to ask about how you see your work in relationship to the history of capitalism overall. There's so much going on in that field. It's a lot of debate about structure versus agency. You seem to fall pretty hard on the individual actors side of that debate. And I'd just like to hear you talk about it a little bit more. And then in terms of like my plans for your next book, I, <laughs> it, 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 Andrew had one, so I have one. I would love to see what you would have to say should you ever choose to write about Nigeria, where the religion is everywhere, um, Muslim and Christian, different categories of both being major players, where global power and the global oil industry are finding huge, you know, uh, relationships with the comprador class there, inequality, huge, but also, um, actors, not just from the global oil industry, but from the local industry making, uh, local um, Nigerians making those connections often through religious networks, global religious networks, so that Christians and Muslims have kind of different networks in terms of oil. Um, the economic devastation in Nigeria is unparalleled, um, definitely part of the cause of the ongoing civil war. Um, and you, instead of wildcatting, you might be thinking about the politics of attacks on pipelines as a revolutionary activity. So unfair, but I would love to see your take on that very complex situation. So thank you again for this really exciting and marvelous book. Well, thank you so much, Andrew and Melanie. Uh, we're gonna invite Darren uh, to respond to some of those uh, excellent questions and insights and ask him to do so. Uh, it's gonna be very difficult, but we know he's up to the task of doing that in, uh, in a timely way so we can open to a broader, uh, broader conversation. Darren? <laughs> thank you so much. I know we have a shorter than usual uh, uh, timeline here, but uh, this was this was fantastic. I learned a lot just from the comments, and uh, let me just say at the outset how much I appreciate Andrew and, and Melanie signing up for this assignment. Uh, two scholars that I respect uh, immensely, and uh, whose work I've learned a great deal from, and uh, uh, I consider them colleagues and, and and friends as well. So I appreciate the time you've taken with this book. Uh, I, I think the book required a bit of time, so uh, <laughs> all the more appreciative of that. And I uh, also just want to thank, uh, uh, of course, Kathy and uh, Madonna, Shane, Philip, Pete, and the Kushwa team uh, for sticking with this uh, through all the COVID adventures. And uh, I was uh, emailing Kathy last night, just uh, kind of lamenting the fact we didn't have a chance to uh, commune over Beef Wellington or something of that sort uh, last night uh, over dinner, Darren, which is Darren, the usual. Darren, you should know it's a Friday in Lent. We would not have had Beef Wellington at Notre Dame. Uh, on, on Oh, of course. <laughs> there you go. That's my That's a rookie mistake you're making about the about Notre rookie Dame. Rookie mistake. It's, it's like a, <laughs> would have been flounder. a Protestant. I don't know what it is. <laughs> you would have had Fish Friday. You're right. No, no, no. I missed I miss uh, Fish Friday. So. But uh, point being, it's uh, uh, unfortunate, but at the same time, uh, this is a great venue, uh, the chance to just uh, speak with so many people from great distances is in its own right, a unique privilege. So uh, thank you to Kushwa uh, for, uh, for putting this on uh, and uh, for all of you for joining us uh, early Saturday morning. Uh, I've had a challenge with my lighting today because I, Actually, I'm dealing with sun in South Bend. Go figure uh, at this time of year. So, so let me just take a few minutes. I'll, uh, I'll do what I can to, to just kind of address a few points. I will want to keep uh, some time for some Q&A. And as I said, I think this is a little bit of a shorter than usual uh, gathering. So the process of writing this book, and uh, this is something that both Andrew and 
and Melody, Melanie uh, kind of asked. Uh, and uh, it's one that i uh, happy to speak to. Uh, certainly the Sunbelt book, you know, put me in contact uh, with place and space. And, and this is something that uh, perhaps I hadn't anticipated as a historian, but coming from the West, I guess it's kind of in my DNA where uh, one can't think about religion, one can't think about politics unless uh, the factors, the dynamics of place and space are at the center. And so uh, I've always been drawn to those types of questions. Uh, thinking here of Tom Tweed as well and his work on sacroscapes, just how religion becomes uh, kind of embedded in, in the landscape itself, how it creates, how particular ecologies, particular encounters with land create particular types uh, or emphases uh, of, of kind of religious experience and encounter. Uh, so the Sunbelt book certainly did that in regards to South uh, uh, Southern California, uh, but you know, in the process of that, at every turn, uh, was coming across oil, uh, was coming across oil men. And uh, uh, it occurred to me as I was wrapping up research for that book that perhaps oil itself should be a little bit more uh, centered in our histories. Uh, and, and just what would it be like to bring oil and religion together as uh, kind of uh, agents of change uh, in American life. So, uh, the questions I, I started to ask uh, initially were very much about, uh, you know, following the money, and 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 this is kind of the uh, the most obvious in into oil. This is how oil history has often been written, uh, particularly those who are uh, critical of it. Uh, kind of big oil uh, following big money uh, and impact on uh, American politics, and and that's kind of my in into the book uh, from Bible Belt to Sun Belt obviously documented a number of institutions that were funded by powerful oilmen. Uh, the politics of, of the right in the West also uh, very much funded by that. So that was my in uh, into the book. And, uh, you know, doesn't take long, as Andrew said, to think about the Pew family and just how important they are and, and absolutely critical, as critical, I, I would say, as the Rockefellers in uh, kind of shaping the trajectory of American uh, religion and politics, at least at the institutional level uh, in the 20th century. And that was my end. But what excited me mo more as I got into uh, this project and as I committed to it fully was uh, thinking about oil and religion at other altitudes. And uh, uh, this is what kind of evolved as, as the research uh, developed. Uh, the higher altitude, you know, uh, again, oil is an anointing of oil at the corporate sector, but going higher up and, and thinking about the nation itself and just what it meant to uh, the project of rebuilding an American nation after the Civil War uh, and just how crucial oil was to the reimagining of, of kind of uh, the nation itself, but also how uh, the nation envisioned itself on a global scale. And uh, it's, 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 I think it's hard to deny just, I mean, the coincidence of this, of, of oil being discovered during the Civil War and uh, uh, being at that very foundational moment, uh, a resource that can allow Americans uh, through the bitterness of this division and war uh, to kind of recreate itself in the years that follow. So that's kind of at the highest altitude. And that's where you know, thinking about uh, the American project in the 20th century, the American century uh, is something I hadn't uh, kind of thought of initially, but as I worked my way into sources, uh, dealing with Aramco, uh, dealing with the Rockefellers, it just seemed to me that this was so crucial to understanding uh, kind of the destiny of, of, of kind of American geopolitics and the American uh, kind of uh, imperial project in the 20th century as, as absolutely critical. And as I say, I think big religion and big oil are the twin pillars of, of American exceptionalism in the 20th century. And then cutting to a lower level, and this is where uh, I, I think I encountered some surprises, and this is where some of the research I did took me into other realms or other uh, kind of lines of questioning, and that was the local, and that was how uh, again, back to Tom Tweed, sacro spaces, you know, how, how does oil itself create particular local ecologies uh, of economy, uh, but also of 
uh, encounters with nature, of understandings of extraction uh, in kind of broader purviews that include uh, the divine, the, the, the sacred. Uh, how does one not just work, but also worship on an oil patch uh, and how is that unique? So uh, that's, I, I guess, you know, the, the, in terms of the, 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 the process of moving from Sunbelt uh, to the oil book uh, was kind of organic in that way. And of course, being from Alberta, as I say in the book, uh, it was uh, also a labor of love, as Andrew suggests, just for me to return to my roots and, and uh, ask questions about my own upbringing, uh, you know, coming of age in the 1980s, a tough time uh, in American and Al Albertan oil. And uh, back to Alberta, Alberta in the last few years, I've seen uh, that the challenges there are greater than ever with uh, considering the Keystone uh, pipeline pipeline and, and the ongoing politics of that. Unlike Texas, uh, which has managed to diversify its economy, uh, Alberta remains very much uh, a, a kind of kind of dictated, uh, attached to oil as its, its, its one resource. And uh, the, the fallout from that has been tremendous. And that has shown itself uh, in uh, churches and the pews and pulpits of that province as well as the politics. So uh, let me uh, quickly try to move through. Oh, there's so much here. Um, let me uh, I, I will talk about the outside in and, and the global aspects that Andrew brings in the transnational. And, uh, you know, I, again, trained as an American historian in, in religion and politics, uh, this proved to be a, a, a daunting project. Uh, for first of all, uh, I didn't know much about oil history. Uh, I again came across some oil men and I thought, hey, wait a second, let's uh, pursue this a bit. Uh, not recognizing, of course, just how extensive oil history as a field is in its own right. Uh, and of course that deals principally with uh, economics, uh, with geopolitics, with foreign relations. Uh, and so I, I felt like I had to, to learn that. It, almost was its own language in its own right, and uh, trying to make sure that uh, uh, I didn't uh, offend those historians, hoping that they would, of course, read this book. Uh, the second kind of daunting factor here was the global, and, and this speaks both to Andrew and Melanie. Uh, you know, my comfort zone is Texas, Oklahoma, Alberta. And uh, so once I, I began to kind of query, question the, the international dimensions of this and make my way into sources, uh, both here in the US and in Britain. And I will say the most exciting, I think one of the most exciting uh, kind of uh, research ventures was, was into the British Petroleum Archives uh, in uh, Warwick, which uh, speaking of missionaries, I think opened up a huge, vast uh, and exciting kind of uh, insight into the role of British uh, missions in uh, the Middle East uh, and in the way in which they facilitated really the early exploration of oil uh, discovery and, and production in that region. Uh, but ultimately I remained very, very much within kind of this US centrist uh, US, I don't even know if it's US in the world. And, and we, we have so many grad students and faculty at Notre Dame who are working rigorously in that area. And I feel like I'm still just kind of uh, touching on that, entering that uh, tentatively, uh, a more global, I think, history of religion and oil is warranted, and uh, that would require, again, skills and language skills in comparative analysis, uh, but my feeling is there's so much more to be done uh, to kind of decenter the U.S. in this history, and uh, I touched on a few books, for instance, about oil in Oman. I know there's others uh, that are being written as we speak. Uh, those who have language skills, uh, ability to bring, uh, you know, Islam and Christianity into conversation. Uh, I certainly, going forward, am considering more of that kind of work. Uh, but uh, I hope that this book is at very least kind of a, a, a launching pad or an entry point into those lines of questioning for historians in terms of how a natural resource, how energy itself uh, brings together uh, different spaces, different geographies, different places together in conversation that transcend state lines, that transcend 
uh, national boundaries and, and that, uh, uh, you know, makes them kind of agents of, of change. Uh, Melanie's, uh, one of Melanie's students, Megan Black, uh, has written just a, tran a transformative book on global interiors, uh, looking at the interior a State Department uh, as an institution that transcends national boundaries, uh, looking at how the pursuit of minerals, uh, you know, uh, again, brought the U.S. Interior Department into a rigorous global engagement in surprising ways. And, and I think to bring religion more kind of forward in that scenario could also be fruitful. Interior religion, I mean, how does uh, the pursuit of minerals, how does the pursuit of of kind of subterranean riches transcend national boundaries, be it in Norway, be it in Indonesia, be it in, uh, you know, uh, Saudi Arabia in the Middle East or in the Southwest of the United States. I think these are lines of questioning that I tentatively approached in this book that I, I would certainly like to see uh, pursued. On, you know, on I tried, levels. Darren. Darren, you have to know I tried. <laughs> no, I know, and I appreciate that. I, 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 uh, I, I sense that. I, uh, as you probably know, I wrote an extensive review of it and reviews in American history, which I just loved. But there was just these teasing, even you know, Mormonism and and uh, you know, Udall. I mean, there, there's ways in which uh, even some of her central characters, I think, uh, were in their own right carrying out their, if you want to say, a civil religion of of extraction. Uh, as, as a way to uh, kind of make the world better, always in uh, kind of uh, a perspective of, of what matters beyond uh, as well. So uh, history of missions, yes, uh, Andrew mentioned that. And, 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 and again, going back to the British Petroleum, I, I was very excited just about uh, the degree to which, you know, it's not necessarily a surprise we know in terms of uh, the corporate expansion, American corporate expansion, always leaned heavily on, on missionary enterprises. Uh, for me, it was surprising on one hand just to see how, how much, uh, whether it's British Petroleum uh, or Anglo, uh, uh, you know, uh, British, uh, uh, the Anglo, uh, the British Petroleum predecessor. Uh, in the Middle East uh, relied on missions or in the South, in South America. I mean, whether it's Standard or uh, Sunoco, of course, missionaries were carving out paths in the jungles. Uh, what, what also interests me in this regard is just the way uh, the reverse happened too. Uh, geologists, oil geologists made their way into these same regions uh, and, and really served as anthropologists. And uh, I spent a number of uh, days in, in archival collections, the papers of a few different geologists, uh, one in particular who I unfortunately had to uh, basically reduce to the cutting room floor in the most part, but Harvey Bassler is just a fascinating story in his own right, uh, worked for Standard Oil, a devout Christian, uh, and throughout the 1920s, 30s, spent uh, his years in South America tracking uh, hundreds of miles and, uh, you know, along the way, not just looking for uh, possibilities of oil, but documenting everything that he encountered, including the religious, uh, the religious cultures of those he spent time with. Uh, and, you know, in, in many ways, the geologist uh, was a missionary in his own right. So uh, there's, there's other ways to, I think, incorporate oil in the story of missions. Let me just uh, wrap up here. Melanie's, I think we've covered a, a few of these uh, wildcat Christianity, and I, what kind of surprises me here is that she felt more convinced by the civil religion of crude category than the wildcat category. For me, it's always been the reverse. I felt that wildcat Christianity was uh, a category that, to me at least, uh, allowed enough room, yes, for evangelicalism to be absolutely at the center of this. Uh, this is a fiercely libertarian uh, kind of uh, encounter with land and politics, anti-statist, uh, individualistic. Uh, however, I, I wanted Wildcat Christianity to, to, to broaden that a bit to include Catholics, uh, to include uh, spiritualism. Uh, I think it's, you know, today we look at Texas, for instance, as, uh, you know, the Bible Belt of, of the country. But uh, in the late 19th century, early 20th century, this was a land of religious experimentation. This was a land of religious diversity. Uh, spiritualism was uh, 
you know, uh, and, and, and a variety of kind of religious uh, communities and, and experiences were welcomed in this, this land of discovery. Uh, and oil was very much part of that. And wildcat Christianity as a category, I thought allowed room for that a little bit more capacious. It's not just about evangelical Christianity. It's about a particular space. It's a particular encounter with land and its resources uh, that uh, created a particular kind of ecology uh, and, and, and in which a particular kind of faith uh, would, would uh, take root. And uh, why is it that the Pews and the Buckleys uh, all find uh, kind of comfort in, in the oil patch of, of Texas. So uh, that's the category. Civil religion accrued was one that I actually struggled with. I, I never found that to be totally satisfying. Uh, in, that, in any case, I'm glad you did, Melanie. Uh, I'm going to wrap up here. We could talk more oil as an agent, and that's, that's of course, an ongoing question, uh, one that I think uh, I approach tentatively, uh, again, thinking about my background, thinking about audience. Uh, I came to this, uh, you know, in my own comfort zone, and, and it was about uh, kind of the institutional structures of American Protestantism, especially, uh, and, and trying to thread oil into that history was, was my main project. Uh, but as I went deeper into it, as I suggested earlier, thinking about energy humanities, thinking about how uh, non-human actors should be more prominent and more central in the stories we tell. Uh, and I certainly agree with that. Uh, I, I would like to think that at very least the readers, the general reader who comes uh, out of this book is going to look at oil as uh, not just more central uh, to American life uh, in this modern era, uh, but look at it as something that has uh, quite literally transformed the way we we, we, we uh, approach our daily lives. Uh, and in that regard, the way we uh, approach, uh, you know, our, 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 our church life, the way we think about faith, uh, the way we approach faith in the modern era. Uh, so yes, I agree. I would like that uh, oil and uh, uh, lumber and coal to be uh, absolutely much more central to our religious histories uh, and certainly uh, political histories of modern America. So I'm going to leave it at that. I know we need uh, some time for Q&A. There's so much more here I would love to talk about, but uh, that's it, Kathy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Darren. We're going to start with a question that comes from uh, one of your doctoral students, actually, uh, Philip Byers, who is uh, curious, and now that the book has been out for some time, how, uh, what differences have you noticed in the ways historians of energy and capitalism have received this book? as opposed to historians of religion? And if there are differences, what does that suggest about, uh, what does that suggest to you, particularly about the history of religion? Thanks, Philip. Uh, Philip, Philip is known in Cora circles, our, our colloquium to ask uh, very well-framed questions, uh, very pointed questions, uh, so uh, this is this is typical, but thank you very much. And it's just, it's a great question. I mean, it, it kind of goes to to what both Melanie and Andrew are suggesting, and and Melanie in particular, uh, you know, thinking about you know writing about energy, writing about oil. Uh, you can take a cultural studies approach. Uh, there there is a kind of an energy humanities that is very kind of anthropological in its emphases. And uh, I have certainly done my best to read and be read up in that field or subfield and be part of the conversation. Uh, but the reality is there is also a skepticism, certainly a skepticism about religion uh, as kind of a substantive kind of agent of, of change. To bring oil and religion together, uh, I, I have felt to be uh, kind of a point, not, not necessarily of, of uh, not necessarily dismissive, but but something that is is a curiosity and, and perhaps not necessarily welcomed. Uh, this is about structural structure. Uh, these questions are being asked uh, within those circles of, of structural change, the Anthropocene, uh, the oppressive nature, uh, without question, of of oil and its damage done to humanity, uh, without perhaps room for some of the contingencies that I would like to uh, write about and analyze. Uh, and to have religion 
churches, institutions, uh, people of faith uh, as taken seriously within that, I think has been a bit of a challenge. Uh, the flip side is, yeah, I mean, I've, I've tried to write for historians of oil and energy, those who are uh, very much wrapped up in geopolitics, wrapped up in economics, uh, and there too the challenge remains, how to uh, kind of nudge them and, and ask them to take religion seriously. So uh, it has been a challenge uh, in that regard. At the same time, I've been grateful to, re to, to receive, uh, you know, emails from from both sides, emails from scholars on both sides, uh, emails from those in the oil industry. And I think these are the most gratifying kind of old timers in oil who have picked up my book and read it and said, hey, this, this is, I lived this life. This is exactly what, you know, what I experienced. And uh, I get it. I get what wildcat Christianity is. Uh, and, uh, you know, when, whenever you're trying to bridge conversations and fields, that's a challenge of whether you're going to be left out altogether or whether you actually are going to try to connect. And, and uh, there have been those connections. And, and going forward, I, I hope there will be more of them. We have a question from our colleague, Linda Pribyshevsky, and it's about cynicism. She wonders, and I think this is something uh, that, that many of us grapple with, uh, she asks, how do you sometimes not think when a historical actor's religious understanding just happens to justify their financial self-interest. Well, that was convenient, she says. She wonders how historians of religion and capitalism <laughs> do not become more cynical. So have you become cynical? And uh, if you haven't, why not? I mean, cynical in what, in what way? I'm always cynical. <laughs> I've always been cynical. I mean, I'm Ukrainian, come on. <laughs> Look, I, my, my goal, and I know Linda, Linda asks, uh, again, this, this, this is a question that Linda does remind us of, uh, you know, in our weekly conversations in Cora and so forth, and, and it's a good one. And uh, I guess my goal as a historian, uh, I, I welcome the gray. Uh, I, I don't feel like, like I, I am so invested and perhaps to a fault. Uh, I don't feel I'm so invested in, on you know, in, in one side or the other, for instance, of this story that I tell, uh, that uh, uh, I'm going to write in a way that's that's clouded by those opinions. I, I this is why I'm a historian and not a political scientist or a sociologist or a pundit. Uh, I, I just feel comfortable in the murkiness of it all, and uh, that goes to trying to decipher the intentions of my subjects. Uh, you know, my, my, my goal as a historian is just try to provide layers of, of uh, contingency and potentials and, and, and meaning and purpose. And, uh, you know, let the reader just try to see my subjects in those kind of multifaceted contexts. Uh, so I don't say, I, I mean, I'm skeptical. Uh, I don't know if I'm cynical and I think there's a difference there. And uh, as historians, I think we should be skeptical. Uh, I, I would hope I'm not moving into the realm of, of cynical, which again, I think is more for punditry than, than the work of historians. So uh, I don't know if that answers that, but- uh, uh, I think that's a really- I, I, Let me just put it this way, Linda. What's that? Go ahead. No, go ahead, Kathy. Oh, no, I, I just think that is, you don't, I don't think of you as a cynical person. And I think that distinction between skepticism and cynicism is really helpful. Why don't we uh, move on to a question that has come up in a variety of forms and that both of our commentators have noted, and that is really the capacious, capaciousness of this book and the depth and breadth of this research, which I think can seem somewhat daunting to someone who's trying to, to do so. Where do you begin? Um, Dennis Coday has a question that asks you to, uh, wonders if there's a, a single source that you can recall that, that particularly surprised or delighted you. This uh, might be akin to Andrew's observation about um, about discovering at the Hegley, uh, the Pew Collection. So is there one that stands out of the many sources that you've examined that uh, was a particular aha moment for you? Yeah, good question. Well, I mean, in terms of Andrew's point, yeah, the Hagley and, you know, I, I think uh, I, I spent a good amount of time in the Hagley 
few papers for the Sunbelt book. So I think maybe one of the first aha moments was uh, uh, when I came across all the files on the Great Canadian Oil Sands Project. And I was just like, you got to be kidding me. I didn't know Pew was uh, in charge of this. And, uh, you know, as I write in the book, I mean, this is, you know, in the early 50s, I mean, it's J. Howard Pugh who makes the largest over $200 million investment in this innovation in, in Alberta, Northern Alberta. And uh, I don't know if you've been to Northern Alberta, probably not, but I mean, this is like <laughs> uh, way out in the wilderness. And uh, so this is the guy who uh, makes the largest private commitment in Canadian history up to that point. And uh, I didn't know that. And so coming across those files were a ha ha because this was a, you know, it's, it's at that point where you say, okay, this is a, a, a direct physical connection between the uh, kind of the institutional structures of, of the church uh, of American evangelicalism and, and what is going to transpire in Northern Alberta. Uh, and as I write in the book, uh, Pew is only going to make this progress uh, because of his relationship with fellow evangelicals uh, uh, in Alberta, uh, Manning, Premier Manning, uh, but also with the help of others like uh, R.G. Letourneau and Billy Graham. So that, that, I guess, would be an aha moment in that regard. I don't say it's the most exciting. I mean, I, I talk about, you know, coming across Patillo Higgins when I was doing some research for the Sunbelt book. And, you know, it, it hadn't been, I think it was around the time that There Will Be Blood came out. And, of course, we had The Apostle with, uh, you know, uh, its, its, its own uh, wonderful uh, cinematography. And, and Patillo Higgins kind of brought these images to mind and, and to understand oil exploration in these uh, kind of utopian terms was also a ha moment. And then I, I guess I'll just say finally, as I said earlier, uh, you know, expanding the story to talk about the Erebus, to talk about Willie Meddy, to talk about Aramco uh, and British Petroleum, uh, which took me six months to get into the archives there uh, because it's so protected as a corporate entity, uh, just to see the linkages between uh, the, the business of oil and missionary enterprises abroad uh, was also very exciting. We have a question from Janine Giordano Drake about um, the shifting meaning of the social gospel. And in particular, could you talk about the global ecumenism imagined by the oil barons and uh, how did big oil shift the meaning of the social gospel? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, uh, you know, I guess I, I didn't, uh, as I said in the interview, I think with with Kush, I didn't anticipate focusing so much on the Rockefellers, but uh, uh, mapping out the generations of the Rockefellers is actually quite helpful, I think, and and certainly three generations, well, four generations too, but the, the generation between, uh, you know, senior to junior, of course, really does represent uh, this embrace of a social gospel of uh, applying uh, applied Christianity uh, to uh, social reform, to to kind of economic uplift, uh, especially at a local level. But uh, Junior, of course, is going to expand that internationally. Uh, Junior really embraces this notion of international brotherhood. Uh, he's going to sponsor a number of kind of ecumenical Protestant conferences. Uh, so this really is kind of that first step, that transition of a social gospel uh, into kind of a Protestant internationalism uh, that Andrew and many others have written about circa 1930s, 1940s. Uh, as I show in the book, I think, you know, oil should be very much part of that story. Uh, I think the interesting transformation also takes place po post-World War II, which is very third generation Rockefellers. And, and what I try to show is that uh, the social gospel continues to influence even the Nelson Rockefellers of the world, uh, perhaps in subtler terms. Uh, but through the Cold War period, I think uh, what, is, what is important to understand is the degree to which the social gospel of international brotherhood uh, becomes more technocratic, uh, you know, very much more invested in, in development, for instance, again, a, a topic that many historians have written about. 
and, and the role of the state, I think, too, becomes uh, a, a much more important player here on a global scale. The, the scale itself of the social gospel in the 1950s and 1960s expands uh, to uh, a, a massive level uh, and is very much attached, of course, to the American project on an international scale. So uh, I don't know if that helps explain. I know Andrew might have something to say here. Uh, if I could, I don't know if I'm allowed to do this. Darren, I don't know. You, you probably didn't want to call on me because I have a follow-up question to that. And I was wondering if you could, I was thinking this as I was reading the book, could you say a little bit more about the complexities of the social gospel in the earlier period where you've, okay, fine, you've got the Rockefeller family and you've got lots of social gospel types or modernists or liberals, or ecumenicals, whatever we want to call them, Harry Emerson Fosdick, John Mott, you've got some great stuff on John Mott and Rockefeller Jr. Um, and they're happy to cooperate, but you've also got Washington Gladden, you've got Ida, Tar I mean, you've got some wonderful stuff on Ida Tarble. Um, you know, you've got this other sort of um, very anti-oil uh, strain coming out of the same, the very same social gospel. So I was wondering if you could disentangle that a little bit. I should have called on you. You're, you're supposed to help answer the question, not ask another one. <laughs> No, no, it's no, it's great. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, it's 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 complex. And Melanie brought this up, and in, in, uh, in terms of the 1960s and 70s, how kind of the civil religion of crew turns on itself, and uh, uh, which I, I very much enjoyed writing about. You know, just to see how within this again capacious uh, kind of community of of social gospelers, you, you did have the corporate types who continued to promote this. Uh, this, this kind of large scale uh, ambition of global transformation through uh, economic development under the guise of, you know, pursuits and, and defense of Christian democracy, uh, the Rockefeller brand, but always within that, of course, is this other strand. And, and it's one I, you know, enjoyed writing about and would have liked to bring to the forefront more. I mean, Ida Tarbell, as I said, is one of my favorite characters in this story. Uh, that, you know, just absolutely tenacious, someone who is informed by her own kind of social justice Christianity, uh, you know, through her own life, through her own experience with a father who is beaten into submission by the Rockefellers, uh, seeing him quite literally, uh, you know, kind of flounder and, 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 and kind of fail before her, the very visuals of his face. I mean, that's something that strikes me. This is visceral. I mean, and this is, again, someone who is committed to a social justice Christianity will move from Methodism to Quakerism. Uh, and that legacy lives on within uh, social gospel Christianity throughout the 20th century. And in the 1960s and 70s will uh, kind of in, in many ways uh, overtake the Rockefeller vision and say, wait a second, uh, you know, our gospel says that we need to be uh, protecting the earth against the damages done by this resource and its extraction. We need to protect humanity from uh, the damage done by the oil curse. And uh, uh, again, one of the, the ironies, uh, certainly the culminating points, and this is why in many ways I, I was determined to write past the Reagan era into the 90s is to see what happens to the Rockefeller family, the fourth generation, as they come to embrace this, this social gospel Christianity uh, that would have been more uh, kind of representative of the Ida Tarbell strand than the John Rockefeller Jr. strand. We just have time for a few more questions. Um, David Zare has a question about other resources. So obviously you focus on oil, but um, could you share anything about other resources such as iron, coal, beef, lumber that uh, perhaps didn't make it into the book? And then to piggyback on that question, I remember when you were had a cut, I forget exactly how much, but I know you had to cut so much. You've already mentioned a few things that you wish had made it into the book. Um, is there anything that just, uh, that you haven't mentioned yet that you just lament uh, how to wind up on the cutting room floor? So the question about other resources uh, and then in general, what didn't make it into the book? Uh, sure, yeah, no, I've been asked this in terms of the other resources and, and uh, uh, you know, I make, I make the claim that oil is unique uh, to the American religious and political experience. I, I think you can make that claim easily for politics. Uh, uh, 
you know, others have written about the American century as absolutely dependent on uh, this nation's uh, century long control of oil uh, in terms of production, in terms of uh, refining, transportation and geopolitics. And, and that really does come to an end uh, in dramatic fashion in the 1970s. So I'm, I'm not making any serious claims there. Uh, what I, you know, again, I'm trying to do is just thread religion into that story uh, in hopes that we also understand the history of American Christianity in the post-Civil War period is perhaps being dictated more than we anticipated by this natural resource. And, uh, you know, the, the narrative might seem familiar to those who are familiar with American Christian Christianity uh, in terms of its history. Uh, many of the flashpoints, uh, you know, kind of shed light on or, or, or remind us of key controversies within American Christianity, the fundamentalist controversy, what have you. Uh, and, and I was hoping to, to show how perhaps if we step back, many of this, uh, many of these flashpoints are actually dictated by, by the politics of oil as well. So uh, at the same time, there's much to be written about other resources and coal has been, of course, uh, absolutely crucial. I do take uh, I did take some of my inspiration from, as I say, uh, elsewhere from Richard Callahan's book on coal, uh, coal religion in Appalachia. Uh, you know, there's much to be said about religion and coal in British Empire, uh, the ways in which uh, this, this natural resource kind of generated the same kinds of uh, imaginative, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, dimensions of, of progress, of uh, of exceptionalism uh, and, and really how it sacralized uh, the, the British kind of uh, empire itself. So there's, there's much to be said about coal. Uh, there's other things to be said, of course, let's lumber, uh, wood. Uh, there's uh, histories to be written uh, about other natural resources as well. Uh, I think still, even as those histories are written, uh, oil will stand out as uh, uniquely important to the uh, American experience uh, in, in the modern era. So, uh, but last thing I'll just say about that briefly again is, is if, we're, if we are looking especially at the local level, uh, I think it's, it's valuable to think about how again, extractive zones, whether oil or coal, for instance, create, I think, slight, slightly unique uh, kind of environments in which the religious experience itself uh, takes on kind of a slightly different hue. I mean, coal mines uh, are very different than drill sites uh, in oil. And, and I think the, the kind of religious encounters that they encourage are also different. Uh, and Richard Callahan again talks about that at length. Uh, in terms of cuts, yes, I had to cut significantly. Uh, it was embarrassing. It, 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 it's a long book. It was much longer and uh, uh, couple areas in which I had to cut, which I regret, but it of course makes sense early on, just thinking about, uh, you know, the nation itself coming out of the civil war and how important oil was. I had to cut a chapter uh, in that area. Uh, some of the details of, of oil exploration, for instance, in, in the West. Uh, and secondly, uh, I spent, uh, I, I wrote a whole chapter on oil exploration in, in South America uh, and uh, the Middle East uh, that included these geologists and very much foregrounded them. Uh, geologists who, again, who are coming to their vocation uh, with, you know, kind of shared commitments uh, to their companies, their oil companies, Standard, British Petroleum, uh, but who, again, who also uh, kind of wore their faith on their sleeves and, and who were curious, who were, uh, intuitive, who were wanting truly to discover uh, what was in front of them, uh, what they could see and what they couldn't see, uh, and to interpret the landscapes they encountered through, you know, through their own understandings of, of the Bible, through their own understandings of, of their faith traditions. And, uh, you know, I, I wish more of that could have been included in the book. It couldn't, of course, uh, thousands of words were cut and it was painful. Uh, but that's that. <laughs> we are coming up on 90 minutes since we began the conversation. So this will be our last question. And then I will invite our panelists to, to weigh in with a final word if, if they'd like. And then um, 
So everyone stays, we'll do the big reveal about what our next book is for the seminar in American religion. Darren, we received, we received a number of questions related to um, the environment and climate change. So this is a, kind of a combination question. Sandra Gustafson um, asks whether, are there religious connections to or threads in the development and climate change work of people like Bill Gates and other tech leaders? And, and also pointing out that um, uh, environmental activism sometimes dismiss, is sometimes dismissed as a pseudo religion, but as you suggest, energy questions always tap into questions about the transcendent. So as you think about new energy sectors, um, do you sense that wind, solar, and other alternatives might also nurture unique religious forms? So kind of a two-part uh, question related to climate change and the environment. Uh, yeah, great, great questions. And, and uh... You know, a subtler takeaway of the book, I hope, is this very point that, uh, you know, to consider next steps, uh, to consider commitments, current commitments to fossil fuel, uh, to fossil resources, uh, energy reserves, uh, or to consider alternatives uh, is not just a, a political question. It's not just an economic one. It's, it's, it's one that uh, touches on, again, the, the existential uh, and it, it touches on the, the theological, it touches on the spiritual, the way in which local communities, especially in proximity to these resources, have to, to grapple with this uh, in, in ways that uh, transcend the political and the economic. So uh, is it any wonder that, uh, you know, being back in Alberta last year giving talks, it, it, ongoing fights over pipelines, are, are so morally charged. And uh, I found myself in the middle of these debates. Uh, so many uh, in the audience would be evangelicals who were absolutely you know, uh, convinced that oil was, was God's blessing and it, it needed to continue to be that way, uh, not just for prosperity, but for a sense of providence. And uh, so to shake that, uh, to shake that kind of, uh, that, kind of, uh, you know, existence, that, that kind of logic uh, is, is going to be a, a, a difficult one if you are looking for, again, alternatives. So uh, yes, this is, this is uh, the question of energy is, I would hope people recognize after reading this book, uh, is, is much more than that. At the same time, uh, wind, solar, are these energy systems that generate the same kind of kind of responses as oil. Uh, certainly there's an entrepreneurialism about them that, you know, kind of uh, reflect the wildcat spirit. And, and that of course can be a positive thing, uh, generating change uh, through a new appreciation of these alternative sources. Uh, at the same time, I don't envision kind of the same clashes of, of kind of wildcat versus civil religion. I think the recognition within uh, these alternative uh, energy regimes uh, at the get-go, you know, recognize, for instance, uh, the importance of, of a certain collaborative uh, enterprise, a certain consolidation, uh, and, a, and a respect for, for federal government intervention as well. There's a certain appreciation of regulation, I think, that uh, is not something the wildcatters of yesteryear would have welcomed. So uh, going forward, I think, yes, we can see some of the similar trends, uh, but I think there's also going to be different questions asked and, and, and different uh, paths laid out. Uh, but no matter, uh, as I said earlier, these are all, again, morally charged questions. And, and I would hope as religious historians that we are uh, taking them seriously and embedding them in our kind of mainstream narratives of American religion uh, in the modern era and, uh, you know, not necessarily, not dismissing them or, or, or even marginalizing them. So, uh, yeah, is that good? Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Melanie or Andrew, would you like to say a final word? Uh, I'm happy to. Um, Darren used, uh, um, I, first of all, I thought this session was, was fantastic. I loved listening to Melanie. I loved hearing Darren talk about the process of writing the book. This was a really fun session. It, I'm glad we did it. It does make it all the more poignant that we couldn't do it in person. And, um, and, and I'm sorry about that, but this is, I'm so glad that we, that we went ahead and did it over Zoom. 
Darren used the phrase morally charged a couple of times. We had a question earlier that was basically about sincerity and whether people's religious beliefs are sincerely expressed in their politics. And I actually didn't find that reading Darren's book that that was ever really an issue because they seem to line up quite quite nicely because that's how people that's how people behave, right? They they have beliefs and those beliefs are expressed in various ways. Um, and to me, something that Darren Darren talks about anti-monopolism, I would call it anti-statism. Anti-monopolism actually might be a better way of putting it, and that to me sort of ties a lot of this wildcat side that uh, wildcatter side that Melanie referred to. To me, that's at the bottom of the religion, the politics, the culture, um, everything. That kind of anti-concentration of power explains why they don't like the Rockefellers, why they don't like the Federal Council of Churches, and so on and so forth. And then finally, I really I'm sorry to, that that we didn't get to hear Darren explain how he's going to write his next book on Nigeria, but <laughs> I guess that's for another another webinar. <clears throat> Melanie, any final words? I so love to assign people the book I'm not going to write. That's uh, that's that's my my secret strategy. Um, I really enjoy doing this a lot. I I think what came to me as we were talking here at the end is the idea about about temperament, about whether you know uh, Andrew raised at the beginning. Does the religion create the political stance vis-a-vis -vis oil and anything else, and or does it work the other way around? And sometimes I feel that people, of course, we're raised in whatever religious uh, or non-religious networks we are, but that people's temperament leads them to like. Um, certain styles of religion and to find that is also true of the style of business that they choose and to find that themselves are networked, you know, those networks meet them halfway in terms of their kind of basic temperament. And so I, I get how the wildcatters might have that temperament. Um, and then I can see how it'd be very interesting to think about people who have that temperament or that individualism or that statism who were Catholic for example, might have some very interesting uh, ways of navigating that that people who are Baptist or Pentecostal did not um, have to do. Not to mention um, the Presbyterians involved. So, I and and of course the Sunni and um, and Shia and other Muslims who themselves are you know roped into these networks and have some have to engage them in some way. So. Um, I think it's a it's um, it's very fruitful for conversation, and I really appreciate the the model. And I think there'll be uh, I can imagine many dissertations now taking off and unpacking some of those categories or um, or, or rethinking them. Um, again, I just want to reiterate what a pleasure this book is and how important it is. And I think um, along with um, another uh, a few books, maybe Emma Wars, um, How to Hide an Empire. This will be one of the books that has us uh, thinking about telling U.S. imperial history um, on, a, on a massive scale um, in, in our teaching and our research over the next few years. So um, it was a pleasure to be part of talking about it. Thank you. The seminar in American religion always flies by even when it's three hours. So it has moved with absolute lightning speed this morning, uh, but we will bring it to a close. I'm delighted to announce our next book and the seminar is scheduled for October 9th. 2021. Our author is actually one of the participants this morning, Kristen Kobes Dumay, and the book is Jesus and John Wayne, How White Evangelicals Corrupted a Faith and Fractured a Nation. Also, one of the participants is uh, our colleague, Emily Remus of Notre Dame's Department of History, and uh, Matthew Sutton, who uh, Darren has, has worked closely with and has thanked uh, profusely in, in his book as well. Uh, Unfortunately, it is too soon to tell whether we will be able to resume in person as we hope to do, uh, but stay tuned and we will be convening on October 9th to discuss Kristen's uh, wonderful and exciting new book, um, uh, One Way or Another. Um, now, I just wanna thank uh, particularly Melanie and Andrew for stimulating uh, such interesting discussion and for engaging the book so thoughtfully. I wanna thank all of you for attending. Uh, we're sorry that we can't see you and uh, we'd love to continue the conversation um, as we would do where we gathered in person. And finally, of course, I just wanna thank uh, my colleague and friend, Darren, for his 
immensely rich book for uh, how thoughtfully he has engaged our questions and uh, really for all that the, the thought that this provokes in all of us. We didn't get to all the questions um, and I'm sorry about that, but uh, I hope Darren, you can take um, and comfort in knowing that you've, you've gotten a lot of people thinking not only about what book you should write next, but surely about what book they should write next. So Darren, uh, you get the very last word of the morning uh, before we send everybody on their way. <laughs> not much left to say. I mean, uh, we, we could talk about Nigeria, Melanie. I've, I've actually just uh, been asked to, to think a bit about that, but I won't be writing that book. Uh, I'm, I'm very excited to write about rubber and religion religion next. So uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes. But that, no, I joke. I'm not doing that. <laughs> That's for uh, maybe a dissertation topic. So, but I do hope this book, and you know, this is these lines of questioning, which I wish we could dig into a bit more, but especially for grad students. And, and I'll have to say, I mean, it's such an honor to be presenting uh, to uh, this seminar. I was a grad student at Notre Dame a long time ago, and I want to say anecdotally, I think one of the first SARS I attended, I think was John Butler talking about a wash in a sea of faith, I believe. And I just remember there was this, you know, debate about whether the first Great Awakening actually happened or not. And it was like, uh, as a grad student, I was a little overwhelmed, but I was, it was invigorating. And I think, uh, uh, Certainly for graduate students, I hope this seminar serves a purpose to, to just kind of help generate uh, you know, new ideas, to, to be excited about next steps and the way in which uh, young scholars can, can take it up and fill in the gaps and, and also run with it in, in unanticipated directions. And uh, certainly I'm excited about the connections between religion and energy. And I think it's a wide open field. I've been teaching a course on, on the, the history of energy in American life uh, many of them engineers, but there's so many in the humanities, both at the undergraduate and graduate level, I think that are, are, are kind of excited to, to move into this area and to, to let history take ownership in some, in some regards of, of this emerging field or subfield. So uh, sky's the limit on that regard, in that regard, and, and I hope this uh, discussion helped uh, kind of spark more interest in that regard. Uh, religion and environment, of course, too, uh, is, is a going concern, all of which uh, brings history to our present moment and, and uh, will have an impact, I think, on, on how we think in the present and going forward, uh, both at the local level, national, but also political as well. So thanks very much for this opportunity. Again, Kathy, it's, it's a real honor. And Andrew, Melanie, uh, incredible comments. I, I appreciate it. I've, I've taken pages of notes, of course, typical. And uh, don't count on an email response from me though. Uh, I'm, let, let's move on and enjoy this sunny weekend here in South Bend and hopefully in DC and Cambridge as well, so. David Stowe points Thank out, you. we've also uh, consumed a lot fewer calories this morning than we normally would have at a Kushwa event, which we usually are laden with coffee and pastry. So whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I'm not sure, <laughs> but, uh, but again, uh, thank you everybody. Have a wonderful day and we'll see you in the fall.